This continues chapter four, sensation and perception, part two. So we've started on, uh, in the last uh, section, we started talking about vision. But now let's talk about how the eye sees. Various structures of your eye work together to focus the light waves from the outside world. Receptor cells in your retina, which are the rods and cones, then will convert these waves into messages that are sent along the optic nerve to be interpreted by your brain. Using this slide here, you can kind of get an idea <clears throat> just how we see. One shows how light is going to first enter our uh, cornea, okay, and it's the cornea also helps us in terms of protecting our eyes in terms of focusing those light rays, okay? The second step is gonna be where the pupil, <clears throat> the light's gonna pass through the pupil and it'll help in adjustments. So for an example, uh, yesterday I had to have my eyes dilated for, for my uh, annual eye exam. And what happens there is it, opens up your pupils wide so that the ophthalmologist, they can kind of look within your eye to see what's going on. However, once they dilate it, it's not going to be able to respond the same way. And it actually took about five, six hours for my eyes to actually get back to normal. So it's, it's that adjuster so a lot of light will come in when your eyes are dilated and when it's constricted it's not as much third step will show how <clears throat> there's muscular control that's within the lenses it helps with focusing light uh, and helps in terms of that uh, helping the retina with light sensitivity the back of the eye you have a lot of fluid that's within the eyeball so you have to it helps in terms of how our um, images are posted remember what we see ahead of us comes upside down, but then it also helps in terms of making that uh, retina show through with the rods and the cones. So let's keep moving forward. <clears throat> now, here's some more steps of how the eye sees. You have the rods, that's the visual receptors, helping to detect the white, black, and gray areas. Um, and it's gonna be mainly responsible for your peripheral vision. Uh, it helps most when talking about nighttime vision or when it's dim. Uh, our cones are gonna be more for color. It's also gonna help provide uh, some more vividness to details. Um, when we're looking at things. There's a lot of sensitivity in terms of our wavelengths, but it helps a lot with our reds, our greens, our blues. The optic nerve then helps in terms of sending that information within the axons and the ganglion cells, and it carries those messages back to our brain. So these various structures <clears throat> of your eye, they work together to focus those light waves from the outside world, okay? Moving forward. Now, <clears throat> here's one of those fun little projects that I'll ask you once again to pause the video and take a moment to look at, okay? Because at the back of the retinal lines, there's an area that has no visual receptors at all, and then there's, which means there's no vision. And this blind spot is pretty much <clears throat> where blood vessels and nerves are enter and exit through your eyeball. Okay, think about blind spots. When would you have to worry about a blind spot? A lot of times we have to worry about it when we're driving, right? Sometimes we rely on our rear view and side view mirrors, but you should actually make turns to your head to see what's by, to the side of you because your peripheral will only go but so far. So make sure you take time to do this and see if the worm actually starts to disappear, okay? You'll close your right eye, you'll stare at it for a moment, and then slowly you'll move your head toward the screen. And the longer you do it, the more that worm seems to not appear to be there anymore. See if it works then. You can send me a message to let me know. 
Now, we're going to move from the eyes and start to speak about the ears. The sense or act of hearing officially is known as audition and has a number of important functions. Ranges from alerting us to dangers to being able to help us communicate with each other. In this section, we're going to start talking about sound waves and then we'll talk about uh, the anatomy of the ear as well as its function. And then finally, we'll talk about issues uh, and problems that we might have with hearing. So the outer ear captures and it'll funnel sound waves into your eardrum. And then there's three tiny bones that's in the, in the middle ear that'll pick up the vibrations from the eardrums and help to transmit them to your inner ear and into your cochlea. Now this snail-shaped cochlea then will transduce or transform this sound into what we call neural messages. And again, what are neural messages? I want that to lock in your head. Again, that would be action potentials. And basically that's our brain processing it to let us know what we consciously are hearing. Like the, similar to the visual process, which helps to transduce light waves into vision, our auditory system is designed to convert sounds into hearing. Uh, their sound waves are going to be produced by air molecules that's moving in a particular wave pattern. So for an example, when an impact, like a tree hit in the ground, you heard that little saying, did the tree truly fall in the forest if we didn't hear it? Well, if there's a tree hitting the ground or there's a vibrating of objects, things like vocal cords or guitar strings, what happens is it creates waves of compressed and expand air, just like if we see it in a lake circling out when we throw a rock. Well, our ears can detect and respond to these small air pressure changes. And to be able to understand how our ears turn sound waves into hearing, we actually have to study the step-by-step -step process that is shown on the slide, okay? So I want you to take time and pause the video for a moment and just go through looking at the uh, responsibilities of the outer ear, the middle ear, as well as the inner ear, and look at how the hair cells help to move those sound waves through. Now, <coughs> excuse me. There are mechanisms determining how we distinguish among sounds kind of differs in pitches that being low to high differ, or depending you know, on the frequency of the sound waves itself. According to place theory, place theory, there's different high frequency sound waves, which would produce high pitched sounds. Maximally, it'll stimulate the hair cells that's gonna um, be different within different locations along your basilar membrane. Hearing for low pitched sounds kind of works differently. So according to frequency theory, low pitch sounds will cause the hair cells along the uh, basilar membrane to bend and it's gonna fire those action potentials at the same rate as it would the frequency of the sound. One example would be a sound with a frequency like 90 Hertz, kind of will produce 90 action potentials per second within the auditory nerve. So pretty much to sum this all up, both place and frequency theories they're both correct, but place theory is going to better explain how we hear high pitch sounds and frequency theory is going to be the best way to explain how we would hear low pitch sounds. Interesting enough, as we get older, we kind of lose our ability to hear those high pitch sounds while still being able to hear the low pitch sounds. We can hear it in the lower, but not as upper, okay? So once again, I want you to remember and recall that both place and frequency theories are the right types of theories, okay? However, place theory deals with high pitch, frequencies dealing with low, okay? Now, how loud is too loud? Now, I know a lot of y'all have your earbuds and got those earbuds. I mean, I have them and we want to listen to our music. Sometimes we just need to focus on other things besides the world outside. So we tend to use that, those uh, earbuds. 
But guess what? You gotta be concerned about it, right? Whether we detect a sound as soft or loud, really gonna depend on its intensity. Waves with high peaks and low valleys, they can produce very loud sound. Those that have relatively low peaks and shallow type valleys will produce those softer type sounds. The relative loudness or softness of sounds is usually going to be measured on a scale of decibels, okay? So the loudness of a sound is measured in decibels, and the higher a sound's decibel reading is, the more damaging it could be to your ear. Chronic exposure to loud noise like loud music that we play off our smartphones into our earbuds, <clears throat> or even heavy traffic. There might be uh, a brief exposure to really loud sounds like the stereo will be at full blast, the jackhammer, a jet engine. This actually can cause permanent nerve deafness. And this is pretty much a disease and biological changes that's associated with aging that can also cause nerve deafness. So for another example, the unfortunate truth is I kind of damaged my uh, ears and I don't hear as well uh, because of the loud noises that I did in my youth. Uh, and then to couple that with aging now and becoming more seasoned, it takes a little bit of time for me to listen. Sometimes it's hard for me to filter as much. So when there's a lot of talking going on, I have to really stop because I don't hear everything as much as I used to. Just remember though, the loudness of a sound is measured by decibels Constant noise over 90 decibels can provide ner uh, permanent ner um, nerve damage to your hearing. So we've gotten past vision, we've gotten past hearing, and now we're going to talk about smell or olfaction. And we'll look at the nose. Again, of, of, when we're talking about olfaction, it's our sense of smell. It's really a useful and sensitive type of tool that we have. Okay, we possess more than thousand types of olfactory receptors and it allows us to be able to detect even more like 10,000 distinct smells. The nose is one of the more sensitive to smoke it's than uh, any type of electronic detector. Uh, and the more we practice or if an individual, for example, has visual impairments, then through practice, they can actually quickly recognize others because of their unique odor. Some research on pheromones, for example, has shown that <clears throat> these compounds are found in natural body scents that can actually affect various behaviors. Supports, it supports the idea that these chemical odors actually increases uh, sexual behavior within humans. However, there has been other findings that will question the results of that, suggesting that human sexuality is a little bit more complex than that of animals. And because of that, more so than perfume advertisements would have you believe, okay? Although it doesn't hurt to smell nice. Now, <clears throat> we're now moving toward taste or gustation the sense of taste. This might be one of our most critical, uh, the least critical of our senses. In the past, though, it's probably been contributed toward our survival. The major function of state is generally aided by smell. When you smell fried chicken, for example, it makes you want to eat. I don't know about you, but it does for me. But it, it is to help us avoid eating or drinking harmful stu substances as well. Okay, so if it was manure and you smell manure, you're not going to be readily to want to eat manure, right? Although some people do like chitlins. And I'll leave it at that. I won't say no more. <laughs> but because many plants <clears throat> that taste bitter, they contain toxic chemicals. And an animal is more likely to survive it if they avoid bitter tasting type of plants. Okay. Uh, humans as well as other animals have a preference for sweet foods. I know I got a sweet tooth. Worse. But this, they're generally going to be more non-poisonous and good sources of energy overall. When we take away our sense of smell, there's going to be five distinct tastes. That being sweet, sour, salty, 
bitter, and umami. Now, umami it means delicious or savory, and it refers basically to sensitivity to the amino acid that's called glutamate. Glutamate is going to be found within meats, meat broths, the monosodium type of um, glutamate, which is also known as MSG. So when you go to the Chinese restaurants, you know you're getting a lot of that. That's what it is. So there's many food and taste preferences that's also going to be that we've learned from our childhood experiences, as well as cultural influences. One example might be that there's many Japanese children that may eat raw fish, and then there's some Chinese children that eat chicken, uh, chicken feet as part of their normal diet. Now, I know for me growing up, I love liver. That's what I was brought up on, love it. However, my children hate it. They're like, no, nah, that's not us. But it was considered part of my normal diet, so I have no problem eating liver. American children might consider those type of foods that I mentioned yucky. Yeah. <laughs> However, most American children would love cheese. I'm one of those uh, kids that grew up on cheese and still love it today. But which children in many other cultures would find repulsive? They might think cheese is horrendous. Understand that cultural and learning experiences also help to explain why adults who are told that a bottle of wine <clears throat> that's $90 versus the real $10 price will report that it tastes better. Ironically, <laughs> these kind of expectations, they actually trigger more brain activity in areas that would respond to pleasant experiences. So our taste receptors are going to respond differently to food molecules of different shapes. The major taste receptors, which is our taste, taste buds, are clustered on our tongues and within little bumps called papillae. And more or less, scientists, once they believe, were specific areas of the tongue that's dedicated to detecting bitter, sweet, salty, and other tastes. But now we kind of know that taste receptors, just like smell receptors, will uh, differentiate to the various type of shapes of food and liquid molecules. The major taste receptors or taste buds are going to be clustered on our tongues within those little bumps of papillae, but a small number of taste receptors are going to also be found in the palate um, in the back of our mouth. So even people without a tongue experience taste sensations. Now, Let's think about pizza. I love pizza. What happens when we eat pizza? Taste receptor cells, as well as sensory cells that respond to touch as well as temperature, are activated on our tongues. Information about taste, smell, texture, temperature, and appearance is going to be sent to the brain, where it'll then integrate with various association regions of the cerebral cortex. Now, these circuits, they're going to get together with those stored memories that we have about our famous pizza moments and our pizza experiences, and it'll work together to produce our perception of what that tastes like, that particular slice. So, A, we need to look at the smell pathway. It's those olfactory receptor neurons. Pretty much, if you look on the slide, it's in the blue you see there, okay? What happens then is that it's going to transform or transduce information from the odorant mo molecules into our nose. And then those uh, nerves will then carry that information into the brain where the synapses in the olfactory bulb is. The second one is the taste pathway. So when we eat and drink liquids and dissolve foods flow over the papillae, the lavender circular areas are going to be into their pores, it's going to be to the taste buds, which will contain those receptors for taste. Those nerves will then carry information into the brainstem, into the thalamus, into the gustatory, <clears throat> gustatory cortex, as well as our somatosensory cortex. All right, so the senses that tell the brain how the body is oriented, where and how the body is moving, and what it touches or is touched by are called the body senses. They include skin senses, the vestibular sense, 
the kinesthesis. Now, the skin senses will reflect the fact that our skin is sensitive to touch or pressure. It's going to be sensitive to temperature as well as pain. The concentration and the depth of the receptors for each of these will vary will be various types of stimuli. So for example, touch receptors are most concentrated on our face, our fingers, uh, and at least it's not so much so on our back or our legs. Even though my legs, if I feel something crawling, I know it's there. <laughs> However, there's some receptors that respond more to that <clears throat> than one type of stimulation. So think about, for example, itching, ticking, as well as vibrating sensations that might produce that light stimulation of both pressure as well as pain receptors. The vestibular sense, which I always have fun with my uh, pronunciation of this, but <clears throat> the vestibular uh, sense is going to be responsible for balance. More or less, it informs the brain of how the body should be, particularly at the head, oriented in respect to gravity as well as three-dimensional space. So when the head moves, liquid in the semicircle canals will be located within the inner ear, will move and bend those hair cell receptors. At the end of the semicircular canal, there are going to be those vestibular sacs. And these contain hair cells that's going to be sensitive to the specific angle of the head. So if it's straight up and down or it's tilted, that information from the semicircular canals and the vestibular sacs will be converted into action potentials that are going to then be carried into the appropriate section of the brain. Kinesthesis is the sense that provides the brain with information about bodily posture, our orientation, as well as movement <clears throat> of individual body parts. Kinesthetic uh, receptors are going to be found throughout the muscles, the joints, our tendons of our body. It allows the brain to know which muscles are being contracted or relaxed. It helps in terms of how our body weight will be distributed, where our arms and legs are going to be in relation to the rest of our body, and so on. So this will end part two of the video lecture. Uh, when we return back with part three, we'll start talking about how to understand perception.